titled my talk herbs and spices and um it's not it's like a few herbs and spices that i mentioned in the bible so um they mentioned in these places so we're going to look at nard calamus myrrh cinnamon and frankincense um we're not going to go through all these verses um i just wanted to show you that they are in the bible so um these are what some of these herbs and spices were used for in biblical times. So all of these were used in incense or anointing oil in the temple in worship of God. Nod was used as an anointing oil in burials and was the most expensive perfume. Calamus was used in anointing oil and incense. Myrrh was used in anointing oil and was also as a painkiller. That what was it was offered to Jesus when he was on the cross. Um, I think it was mixed with vinegar. And then cinnamon was also used in anointing oil for its fragrance and medicinal uses. And frankincense was used in incense because of its very fragrant aroma. Frankincense sometimes would also, it's not always mentioned as frankincense it would be mentioned as a uh, sweet smelling um I can't remember I think something with yeah perfume so then we're just gonna I'm just gonna show you like what they looked like and where they came from because most of these herbs and spices that we're gonna look at today and the spiritual lessons well what I saw um didn't come from Israel they were from far away. So Nard came from the Eastern Himalayas, um, near Nepal and Mexican and Bhutan. And it grows only at between 3,000 and 5,000 meters above sea level. It only grows to about 10 to 15 centimeters. And then the essential oils are harvested from a rhizome. Now rhizome, if you don't know, it's like when you grow grass, it's the long root that grows horizontally. Um, and then they are crushed and then distilled to extract the oil. It was very expensive, especially pure nard. Um, so it was, lots of it was mixed with lower priced oil. Then calamus. So if you look at the calamus, the first picture, the long root going along, that's the rhizome that I was talking about. So calamus came from Arabia and India and was imported to Israel. It was a reed and it had to be dried, picked and pulverized and was also used in anointing oil and incense. And some say it was what we know as lemongrass today. Then myrrh, that's what it looks like. It looks very pointy and spiky. So myrrh is a resin which is extracted from a tree that originates from Africa and Southeast Asia, Saudi Arabia and Oman. Myrrh is exuded as a fluid from resin ducts in the tree bark. And when the bark splits naturally, or if people are harvesting it, they cut it for tapping. And upon exposure to air, myrrh hardens slowly into globules and irregular lumps called tears. Myrrh is also considered a spice and was used in incense, anointing oil, embalming, and for pain relief. Then frankincense. Frankincense is a resin that comes from the boswellia trees and is considered a spice. It was found in, or still found in North Africa and India, uh, but can also be found in Oman, Yemen, and West Africa. But they say the quality of those is not as good. And then incisions are made into the trunk, which exudes as like a milk-like juice, which is hardened also an exposure to air. It was used in incense because of its fragrance. And then cinnamon. Cinnamon is native to India and Sri Lanka. Um, it's harvested from the bark of the tree. And it's when they are scraping the bark, the way it rolls is you'll see how good it is on that. So this spice was used in anointing oil. It was very costly and was also used for gifts as things and it was used medicinally for its amazing health benefits. So 
Now, these are the lessons I thought of when I was looking at them. So for me, nod, I've got wholeheartedness. So spark nod or nod only grows at a certain altitude and can only be harvested for a certain period each year. The oil is extracted from the dried and crushed bronzons by steam distillation, which only yields one to three percent of oil from the original rhinestones. So to yield one kg of essential oil, you would need a hundred tons of rhinestone. And this is why it is so expensive. So the lesson is giving our best, our whole heart. Mary anointed Jesus' feet with pure nard oil. It is often speculated that this was her dowry. And by breaking the jar, she was giving him her best and everything that she owned. And this is what is, is expected of all of us. We're all told to give our best. So in Numbers 18, verse 29, you must present yourself as, you must present as the Lord's portion, the best and holiest part in everything given to you. And then in Numbers 14, verse 24, but because my servant Caleb has a different spirit and follows me wholeheartedly, I will bring him into the land he went to and his descendants will inherit it. And then Romans 12 verse 1, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. So God doesn't want us to be half-hearted. So then Numbers 32 verses 10 to 11, the Lord's anger was aroused that day and he swore this oath because they have not followed me wholeheartedly, not one of the men 20 years old or more who came up out of Egypt will see the land I promised. Revelation 3 verse 16, because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I was, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. So these are what I found, well, it's 10 guideposts for wholehearted living, but this was for life, but I think we can use it um, in our spiritual lives as well. So cultivating authenticity is letting go of what people think. So I thought of Psalm 56 verse 4, and it says, in God whose Word our praise in God our trust. I will not be afraid. What can mortal man do to me? And then cultivating self compassion is letting go of perfectionism. Um, so don't expect yourself to be perfect all the time, but also not expecting others to be perfect and in so judging them. Um, cultivating your resilient spirit. Um, so there was a verse in Philippians. Three, it says, I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. So just letting go of what is what you've done already and focus on getting better. Cultivating gratitude and joy is letting go of scarcity and fear of the dark. So be joyful. Joyful um, is like a state of mind rather than like a feeling. Happiness is more the feeling, so create a joyful state of mind. Then cultivating intuition and trusting faith is letting go of the need for certainty. God knows everything. It says God knows the beginning from the end, so don't worry about it. Have faith. Cultivating creativity, letting go of comparison. Don't compare yourself to others. Rather focus on what God wants from you. Cultivating claim rest is letting go of exhaustion as a status symbol and pro productivity as self-worth so we need to be able to rest our prior time as well and just because we are busy and exhausted it doesn't measure our self-worth we don't have to be um, busy all the time cultivating calm and stillness is letting go of and and Anxiety as a lifestyle, so it's also a stop worrying, just be calm and still and know that God is watching out for you. Cultivating meaningful work, letting go of self doubt and supposed to, I was supposed to do it, rather do it and yeah, stop worrying about it. Cultivating laughter, song and dance, letting go of cool and always in control. So 
yeah, I live a happy life and don't always worry about being cool. So then this is, um, I thought it was very nice. It says, give God the best, not just what's left. And then calamus. So calamus was the sweet fragrance. So calamus rhinestone was beaten and pulverized to extract the essential oil, the sweet smelling fragrance. Jesus' sacrifice is described in Ephesians as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Ephesians 5 verse 2. And live a life of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. God is love. Jesus gave himself in love to God and in his love for us. We should then be living in love and expressing our love of God in love for others. Living a life of love. So in 1 Corinthians 16, verse 14, it says, do everything in love. 1 John 3, verse 18, let us not love with words of time, but with actions and in spirit. And then I found these two little quotes. It says, there's no place that you can go where God's love isn't. You'll never be separated from God's love. And then if we have got the true love of God shed abroad in our hearts, we will show it in our lives. We will not have to go up and down the earth proclaiming it. We will show it in everything we do or say. So love is not just a word. It's actually doing something. So what is love? I'm sure we all know this. First Corinthians 13 verses 4 to 7. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It's not irritable and keeps no record of being wrong. It does not rejoice about injustice, but whenever the truth wins out, love never gives up, never loses faith, is always held hopeful and endures through every circumstance. Love never fails. So rather than being judgmental and critical of each other, may we have the pure love of Christ for our fellow travelers in this journey through life. And that's by Thomas S. Monson. Okay, so spreading the fragrance of God. Second Corinthians 2 verse 14. But thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and through us reveals the fragrance of the knowledge of him in every place. By showing our love of God in our actions and the way we live our lives, we are spreading God's message, and that is a fragrance. So spread the love of God through your life, but only use words when necessary. So it's more about actions than about words. So myrrh, letting our love flow. So myrrh is harvested by repeatedly wounding the trees to bleed the gum, which is waxy and coagulates quickly. Letting our love flow can be difficult, especially when we are so different in many ways. We can feel our love stop to when what we can feel our love stop to flow. We must then examine why, why it's so and then find a way in which we can open ourselves up to love again. So um sometimes like with me with this, it's not like my love will stop flowing, but I think it just take a different way of expressing it so I won't be as loud or vocal about it and that's something like I have to work on and then also being indifferent with me like sometimes I'm just like oh it doesn't affect me so but we should show our love in every way so Jesus showed God's love to all even though he didn't condone their behavior so in John 4 verses 7 to 26 Jesus spoke to the Samaritan woman and told about God and what God required his worshippers, that they should worship in spirit and in truth. So the same, I think, goes for the um, scribes and Pharisees, where Jesus wanted them to know. And this is where the agape love comes in, where you love somebody even though they are not doing what you want them to do. So remember the parable of the good Samaritan. Who is your neighbor? So who is our neighbor? Everyone that we can show God's love to. And then I found this. So loving your neighbor is easy when he's nice or when she's the same as you. But the rule is love thy neighbor. 
even if he is different, even if she's a bit mean, even if they don't believe in the same things as you. You don't have to hang out with your neighbor or agree with them, just love them. Treat them with as much respect and acceptance as you'd like them to treat you. And then show love. So showing love, be genuine, listen, pick, speak kindly to others, lend a hand, open the door for people, give hugs, say I love you. Think of others' feelings, be polite, use your manners, encourage, praise, and respect. And then love is a verb without action, it's just the word. So frankincense, frankincense is harvested just like moo. So through the tapping process, the harvester scrapes five inch long cuts on the trunk of the tree which grows in a desert. So gathering frankincense was a very time consuming purpose. Over the period of two or three months, the sap would leak from the tree and harden into white tears. The harvester would return and scrape the crystals off and the hardened gum would be distilled for perfume or crushed and burned as incense. So a time consuming process. Through all the trials in our lives, whatever they may be, it just helps us to remember God and his love for us. Every trial we go through is designed to make us a better disciple of God. If we changed our mindset to these, instead of why is this happening to me, but what can this teach me? We can only grow in love for God and then in turn love for others. So James 1 verse 1, blessed is the man who remains steadfast under child, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 16 to 18, rejoice always, pray continuously, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And then in Isaiah 55, verse 89, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So when trouble comes your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. James 1, verse 2. So I found this, and it says, um, like you say, God says, and then the Bible verse. Now, some of these, it's actually Jesus talking, but um, yeah, I use it anyway because Jesus is telling us God's message. So it says, You say it's impossible, and God says, All things are possible. You say, I'm too tired. God says, I will give you rest. You say, Nobody really loves me. God says, I love you. You say, I can't go on. God says, My grace is sufficient. You say, I can't figure things out. God says, I will direct your steps. You say, I can't do it. God says, you can do all things. You say, I'm not able. God says, I am able. You say, it's not worth it. God says, it will be worth it. You say, I can't forgive myself. God says, I forgive you. You say, I can't manage. God says, I will supply all your needs. You say, I'm afraid. God says, I have not given you a spirit of fear. You say, I'm always worried and frustrated. God says, cast all your cares on me. You say, I'm not smart enough. God says, I give you wisdom. You say, I feel all alone. God says, I will never leave you or forsake you. So the change in your mind when you prioritize God will take more than a week of devotionals, more than the occasional prayer. It will take a consistent prioritization of God in your life to feel the spiritual changes of God, being in control of God, being the center of God, being the priority. And then the last one is cinnamon. So cinnamon is just the inner bark of a tree, yet it has been very valuable for centuries, both as a medicine and as a spice. So just half a teaspoon a day can have major health, have major benefits to our health. So in a recent research review, it concluded that cinnamon contains compounds that protect against chronic inflammation within the body, diabetes and insulin resistance, bacterial and fungal infections, and can help with cancer, strokes, heart disease, as well as protecting the brain. So if we think of cinnamon as a Bible and how it can protect us and encourage us by reading our Bible every day, just like taking the cinnamon was daily, 
it can influence our decision to make better spiritual choices. And um, I remember in Liesl's class that she said um, about the study that they had done with reading your Bible and how it worked better if you read it more often. So in Psalm 119, verse 105, your words are a lamp unto my feet. Psalm 119, verse 11. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Romans 15, verse 4. Whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Proverbs 3, verses 5 to 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. Isaiah 41, verse 13. For I, the Lord your God, hold your right hand. It is I who say to you, fear not, I am the one who helps you. So the primary purpose of reading the Bible is not to know the Bible, but to know God. That's what James is near it. So a relationship with God is the most important relationship you can have. Embrace it every day. So in conclusion, I came up with this verse from 2 Chronicles 15 verse 7. But as for you, be strong and do not give up, for your work will be rewarded. Okay, so I'll just close and pray quickly. Heavenly Father, embrace us with your tranquility and love so that our minds can be at ease. Break every train of negative thoughts and speak prosperity and positivity into our lives. For our lives, every day, we therefore declare and decree. So we ask you please to be with us in this next week. And we thank you for all your many wonderful things that you have done for us and for your love for us. And we pray that we will be able to show that love to others. We thank you for everything you do for us. In Jesus' name, amen.